Greetings and welcome to room 303 and uh, Senior English B. And we now turn in your hymnals to pages 714, 715, and following. We are introducing you to Unit 4. They're calling this unit Rebels and Dreamers, the Romantic Period. And of course we are in Senior English B, which is British Literature. So we're talking now about the British Romantic Period. Note your dates. Let's write them down. 1798 to 1832. You've got the quote from Coleridge uh, um, Kublai Khan, but oh that deep romantic chasm which slanted down the green hill athwart a cedar cover, a savage place as holy and enchanted as e'er beneath the waning moon was haunted. We're going to turn now to uh, do some reading and all you're working now is at level one. All you have to do is just bullet point as we go I'll be reading with you. All you're doing is reading along with me and taking notes as we go. Of course, we are um, here going to introduce you to the overall period on page 716, what they call the snapshot of the period. Read with me. During the Romantic period, all the attitudes and assumptions of 18th century classicism and rationalism were dramatically challenged in part by social and political upheavals. The French Revolution, which began on July 14, 1789, shook the established order in the name of democratic ideals. Fearing the events in France, the English ruling class also felt threatened by unrest at home. British authorities tried to repress workers' efforts to organize, going so far as to kill a number of peaceful demonstrators in Manchester in 1819. Another type of revolution, the Industrial Revolution, boosted the growth of manufacturing but also brought poverty and suffering for those who worked or failed to find work in slum-ridden cities. British Romantic writers responded to the climate of their times. For many of them, the faith in science and reason so characteristic of 18th century thought no longer applied in a world of tyranny and factories. And uh, there, right below it, in 1819, thousands of workers and their families demonstrated peacefully at St. Peter's Fields in Manchester to protest desperate economic conditions and to gain parliamentary reforms. Soldiers dispersed the crowd, injuring about 500 people and killing 11. You also have some uh, information on page 717. Um, the images below, the cracked facade and the pictures swirling out of, uh, out of it to dramatize the way in which romantic values challenged earlier neoclassical beliefs in order and balance. And then of course you'll have some question here of which of these romantic values described in the captions are still influential today, which seem historically interesting but no longer directly relevant to us today. All right, let's turn now to 718. As in all of the other intro units for this is unit four, we are uh, now going to work with the historical background first and then some of those important key questions. Let's just read. We're taking notes. You have your timeline at the bottom of the page to kind of help you situate or place yourself in this time. Now again, the Romantic period, 1798 to 1832. Of course, as I've already said in other lectures, the easy date to remember is just 1800, okay? Let's look at it. For the first half of the Romantic period, England was at war with France. At home, the period was marked by growing urbanization and industrialization and demands for reform. At the end, a wasteful monarchy was redeemed by the succession of a shy 18-year-old girl, Victoria. The first heading, English victories over Napoleon. Revolutionary France, led by Napoleon Bonaparte, declared war on Britain in 1793. These dates you want to make sure you have in your notes. In the ensuing conflict, two national heroes emerged for England. At sea, Lord Horatio Nelson shattered the French fleet at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1805, ensuring that Britannia would rule the waves for the next century. Nelson, dying at his moment of triumph, passed immediately into legend. On land, the Duke of Wellington defeated Napoleon at Waterloo, 1815. It's, of course, a pivotal moment. With Napoleon in exile, the victors met in the conference known as the Congress of Vienna, 1814 to 15, and tried to restore Europe to what it had been before the French Revolution. However, the ideas unleashed by that revolution and the earth-shaking changes of the Industrial Revolution were more powerful than any reactionary politician imagined. Next heading, industrialization and urbanization. In 1807, Robert Fulton launched his steamboat, and in 1814, George Stefferson George Stephenson built a steam locomotive. 
Railroads changed the face of England and steamships shrank oceans. It was the textile industry, however, that was at the forefront of change. Inventions from the spinning jenny to the power loom changed the way cloth was woven and moved the weaver from the spinning wheel in the kitchen to the factory. Water power and then coal drove the machines that ran the mills that created the cities in which the workers lived. Wealth no longer depended on land, and workers separated from the land realized that they would have to unite in political action. The Reform Bill of 1832, the product of democratic impulses and the changing economic conditions, was a first step in extending the right to vote. It increased the voting rolls by 57%. But the working classes and some members of the lower middle classes were still unable to vote. In 1833, after the period ended, Parliament abolished slavery in the British Empire. That's a huge one. 1833, Par Parliament in England abolished slavery in the British Empire. The next heading, an out-of-touch monarchy. I'm on page 719. The struggle for increased political rights was a difficult one. Those in power and those who wanted reform collided tragically at St. Peter's Field, Manchester in 1819. Workers had assembled in a peaceful demonstration for economic and political reform. A cavalry charge killed 11 and wounded many women and children. Called the Peterloo Massacre, the incident inspired Shelley to write, quote, England in, in 1819, which opens an old man, blind, despised, and dying king, end quote. Cruelly accurate, the line describes George III, who had been declared insane in 1811. His son, Prince Regent, was designed to rule, was designated to rule in his place. A regent substitutes for a ruler. This gave the period its name, the Regency, and the regent's conduct gave it scandalous reputation. Extravagant, obese, separated from his wife in an ugly and very public marital quarrel, he was unaware of the great changes taking place around him. The regent became George IV in 1820. In 1830, he was succeeded by his brother William, who had ten illegitimate children with his common wife, but no legitimate heir. When William died in 1837, the daughter of his younger brother was next in the royal line. That daughter, Victoria, was determined to restore morality and dignity to the throne. She became the queen and then the symbol of an era in which political reform and industrial might made England the most powerful country in the world. Key historical, next heading, key historical theme, political oppression versus political reform. Conservative European rulers tried to roll back revolutionary ideas. In England, industrialization prompted workers to organize. Police killed peacefully protesting workers in Manchester in 1819. The Reform Bill of 1832 extended the right to vote, but not to the working classes. All right, let's turn to 720. The essential questions across time, as you know from earlier studies of Units 1, 2, and 3 in Senior English A, we have these essential questions across time that are always a part of our study. Again, the dates for you, 1798 to 1832 in the Romantic period. The first question, what is the relationship between literature and place? Let's read together. English Romanticism was born in and inspired by a real place, the Lake District. We're going to see the, a feature on the next page. However, since Romanticism defines itself by opposition to the commonplace and familiar, much of the literature of the period is also set in exotic and faraway locations. First heading, how did Romantics emphasize strange and faraway places? In poetry, the Romantics took readers to distant lands, both real and imaginary. For example, Samuel Taylor Coleridge's Ancient Mariner sails around Cape Horn to the edge of Antarctica, which was just then being explored. He returns to narrate his strange adventures. In Coleridge's Kubla Khan, the famous <coughs> emperor dwells in a place that has come to symbolize luxury and mystery, Xanadu. Similarly, Percy Bysshe Shelley's poem Ozymandias takes us to an antique land, the Egypt of the Pharaohs, which had recently been invaded and plundered by Napoleon. Next heading, what worlds become refuges from the smoky cities? Whether or not they wrote of exotic lands, the Romantic poets all sought something beyond this world, turning to nature and the imagination for transcendence. The worlds they explored were alternatives to the spreading stain of the cities, to what the poet William Blake called the, quote, dark satanic mills, end quote, factories that seemed to chew up people. The next heading, the Lake District. 
William Wordsworth, who settled in the beautiful Lake District far from the urban blight of London, Manchester, and Birmingham, wrote of the natural world in a religious way, a quote-unquote worshiper of nature, end quote. He saw the landscape bathed in a heavenly light. Also on page 720, do note those vocab words that could end up on the exam, those three that are there. 721, going beyond. Wordsworth was a native of the Lake District. He had climbed its mountains and rode across its lakes. He saw ideal beauty in the land that spread out before him. However, when Shelley writes of the Skylark and John Keats of the Nightingale, they're not concerned with describing these birds in their natural setting. Each celebrates the song and the flight of the bird that lures the poet beyond the bounds of earth. The urban world the Romantics fled was not, as Wordsworth discovered, completely bleak. Wordsworth, poet of nature in the countryside, had, had a moment of stunned revelation. When at dawn, on a clear September morning, he saw London from Westminster Bridge. He says, Earth, he wrote, has not anything to show more fair. End quote. The city improved or blighted. London had indeed been improved. The architect, John Nash, contributed to the secular beautification of London, as Christopher Wren had to the ecclesiastical with the rebuilding of St. Paul's Cathedral after the Great Fire of 1666. Nash built the Brighton Pavilion, modeled in part on India's Taj Mahal, another example of the period's taste for the exotic and fantastic. Bath, a city forever connected with Regency novelist Jane Austen, created its beautiful crescents, or curved streets, during this time. However, these Regency splendors were the exception, what the novelist Charles Dickens would later call Coke Town, a dirty, soul-destroying city, stands for the world in which the Romantic poets struggled to escape. In the box on page 721, the British tradition close up on geography, let's read there, the Lake District Cradle of Romanticism. The cradle of English Romanticism is the Lake District, located in the northwest of England. This picturesque region contains some of the country's most impressive mountains and lakes. The Romantic poet William Wordsworth was born in the, lake, in the Lake District, wandered there as a boy, lived there as a man, and wrote poems inspired by its beauty. In the following passage, Wordsworth captures the mystery and thrill of his boyhood climbing expeditions in the region. From the prelude, oh, and this is again Wordsworth, oh, at that time, while on the perilous ridge I hung alone, with what strange utterance did the loud, dry wind blow through my ears. The sky seemed not a sky of earth, and with what motion moved the clouds. All right, let's turn now to 722. The next question, how does literature shape or reflect society? The French Revolution hit Europe like a tidal wave. The Industrial Revolution, which owes so much to inventor James Watts' improvements of the steam engine, is still shaping the world today. The social history of the period is the story of how people in general, and writers in particular, reacted to the shocks of these revolutions. First heading, how did political and industrial revolutions affect society? First heading, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive? In his autobiographical epic, The Prelude, William Wordsworth looks back on the heady days when he and the French Revolution were young. Europe, he says, was thrilled with joy, quote unquote, at the prospect of, quote, human nature seeming born again, end quote. Book 6, lines 340 to 342. More personally and potently, quote, bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. End quote. Book 11, lines 108 to 109. Next heading, disillusionment sets in. The revolution, however, turned blindly destructive, and England and France went to war. The young poet's bliss faded quickly, as did that of many who had such hope in the beginning. Napoleon's crowning himself emperor ended any belief that human nature had been born again. Next heading, trying to bring back the old order. In the aftermath of Napoleon's defeat, those in power were determined that human nature would not be reborn and that the old order would be restored. The privileged few would continue to rule. However, the forces of democratic reform had been unleashed and could not be suppressed. Next heading, ideas that would not die. The original message of the revolution, the one that had thrilled Wordsworth, was that people were to be free in their personal lives and free to choose their government, that all people were equally citizens. Although the later course of the revolution might have distorted these ideas, the ideas themselves would not die. 
Note the essential vocabulary uh, there on page 722 that could end up on the exam. Uh, top of 723. In England, a group of men and women, mostly Quakers, led by William Wilberforce, were determined that one ancient social institution would be abolished. Thanks to them, slavery was ended in England and in the empire. <coughs> the Reform Bill of 1832 was another part of the peaceful revolution that transformed England. It extended the right to vote to many males previously disqualified by lack of wealth. The 1832 bill was a step in a century-long journey that in the end gave all citizens voting rights. The next heading, the application of power to work. Revolutions are about power, and the Industrial Revolution was about the application of power to work, the creation of machines that work while human beings feed and tend them. Unfortunately, the mills and the cities that grew up around them crushed and destroyed many who came from the countryside looking for new opportunities. Economic progress exacted an enormous human price. Next heading, how did writers react to revolutionary changes? Direct responses. Some writers directly address the problems of their changing world. Mary Wollstonecraft, a witness to the French Revolution, urged a, urged a radical transformation of society in her vindication of the rights of women. Among other social institutions, she criticized, quote, a false system of education, end quote, geared to make women marriageable rather than knowledgeable. On page 723, the British tradition, The Changing English Language by Richard Leader. Let's read that one really quickly, The Romantic Age. During the Romantic Age, Britannia ruled the waves and English ruled much of the land as British ships traveled throughout the world. They left the language of the mother country in their wake but also came home from foreign ports laden with cargoes of words from other languages freighted with new meanings for English speakers. The biggest and fattest unabridged English dictionaries hold more than 600,000 words compared to German in second place with 185,000 words. One reason we've accumulated the world's largest and most varied vocabulary is that English continues to be the most hospitable and democratic language that has ever existed, unique in the number and variety of its borrowed words. The following are words that became part of the English language as a result of England's great economic expansion. For example, out of Africa we get words like banana, boorish, chimpanzee, gorilla, jumbo, and zebra. From Asia we get jingham, uh, uh, indigo, mango, typhoon. From Australia we get boomerang and kangaroo. From India, we get all kinds of words, bandana, bungalow, calico, cashmere, china, cot, curry, juggernaut, jungle, loot, nirvana, polo, punch, beverage, thug, and veranda, all coming from India. So lots and lots of words in English language. Let's turn over to 724 and the Common Core Multiple Perspectives on the ERA. Let's look at that one for just a second at the top of 724. Blake made his readers look at the reality of child labor in The Chimney Sweeper. This is a poem that we're going to be working with later. Lord Byron spoke in defense of the lower classes when Parliament debated using the death penalty against protesting unemployed weavers. This rebellious aristocrat, who would later die in the Greek War of Independence, declared, I have been in some of the most oppressed provinces of Turkey, but never did I behold such squalid wretchedness as I have seen since my return in the very heart of a Christian country. Shelley's poem, Men of England, later became the anthem of the British Labour Party. Men of England, wherefore plow for the lords who lay ye low? Wherefore weave with toil and care the rich robes your tyrants wear? Other ways, the next heading. Some writers reminded people of the other ways of being. Nature in the poetry of Wordsworth is not the artificial world of pastoral poetry. His nature is a clearer, cleaner greener world in which human nature can be, if not reborn, at least restored. He writes in Tintern Abbey, nature never did betray the heart that loved her. Next heading, revolution on a page. Not only that, Wordsworth's focus on common people and their language was a translation of the political goals of the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, into literature. If revolution had turned to terror on the stage of history, it still might be successful on the page. The next heading, an era of change. The people of the time faced unprecedented changes. No political order could ever again be seen as unchangeable. That all people should be free and free to choose their leaders were ideas whose time had come. The economic progress could only be had at the cost of, of blighting the world 
at the cost of blighting the world was an idea to be challenged. Some writers spoke out against the ills they saw. Others looked inward or far away to see worlds that might be. Human nature was not born again, but human beings were changed profoundly. On page 725, next question. What is the relationship of the writer to tradition? No writer of the period called himself or herself romantic. That's important. Put it in your notes. Romantic writers did not call themselves romantic. This is an appellation applied later. But later, critics applied the term because they saw consistent themes and attitudes in the literature. Romantic, in this sense, does not mean love stories. Write that down. That's huge. Romantic does not mean love stories. Again, I'm reading at the top of 725. It means everything that is the opposite of the drab, the ordinary, the conventional, the routine, the predictable, and the expected. The next heading, the far away and exotic. Romantic literature can be realistic, as in Scottish poet Robert Burns to a louse, but the emphasis is on the far away and exotic, as in the Xanadu of Coleridge's Kubla Khan and the fantastic and supernatural of his The Rhyme of the Ancient Mariner. Next heading question. In what ways did Romantics reject previous traditions? First heading, discarding 18th century forms. Romantics were by nature rebellious, unhappy with, and unwilling to settle for the status quo. They cast aside the literary forms and subjects that had dominated the previous century. No more conventions and artificialities, satires and heroic couplets. Such forms were to be swept away as the French Revolution had swept away powdered wigs and the knee breeches. Prefigured by Burns and Blake, the new literature was to be authentic and sincere. The next heading, using ordinary speech. The use of ordinary speech in Romantic literature gave its authentic feel. The poems of Burns and Joanna Bailey, written in Scottish dialect, proved to be popular with people of the common or uneducated class. Romantics achieved sincerity by revealing their personal thoughts and feelings. For example, Wordsworth charged the development of his consciousness with sincerity in The Prelude. 